Hello. I think people are in. Some of them. Hello, hello. <clears throat> for those of you who have arrived, hello. Um, thanks for joining the Spitfire Summer School um, and the Masterclass. We'll give like for three to five minutes, probably more like five minutes, just to wait for people who might be late or have trouble with the computer. So if you guys want to make yourself a cup of tea, um, coffee in the morning, if, if you're in Europe, maybe a beer or a wine, then you have time for that. We'll, we're going we're gonna to start at, at five past. Wow, from India. Amazing. Early morning, Australia, New York. Wow, this is beautiful. Ecuador. Hola, ¿qué tal? Yo estoy en España. Um, hello from Wales, London. Wow, this is this is brilliant. I guess this is the beauty from um, doing this online. You get people from all over the world. This is amazing. Toronto, Nashville, cool. Philippines, wow. 2 a.m., did you get up? It, did you get up in the middle of the night or stayed up? Brighton, yes, Brighton, second home. Scored a podcast. That's pretty cool. Stayed up, <laughs> nice. Um, California, cool. Nice, Mexico City. Sweden, cool. Pretty great effort to stay up um, for that long. Quite nice. Thank you very much. Belgium. Cool. Scored a podcast. That's pretty good. Wasn't Alexandre Desplat was on there quite recently, wasn't he? Surrey. Cool. We got people from, from everywhere. From all the continents, I believe. That's amazing. Okay. Um, I think we're just going to uh, slowly start. It's five past now, so I don't want to keep you guys um, Antarctic. <laughs> yeah. I guess. So, hi guys, this is Oliver from Spitfire Audio. Welcome to the masterclass for our Spitfire Summer School 2020. In this one, we'll be looking at developing your own creative voice. Um, so just a quick intro, if you don't know me, I've been working with Spitfire for about five, five and a half years. Uh, I score films, TV, uh, games, I do um, some ads here and there uh, to spruce up a little bit the pocket money. I release my own music, uh, I've just released my uh, um, debut album with SA Recordings uh, together with a sample library released via Spitfire Audio. Uh, I released music, uh, just released something with Moderna Records. And um, yeah, that's kind of the, the short uh, story. Uh, in this uh, video or uh, class, I guess, we're going to look at a uh, practical example and analyze a score I've written for uh, the BBC. Uh, it was a documentary that was about four or five years ago. So uh, pretty fresh uh, as I came out of university, uh, I was able and I was lucky enough to score a, a documentary for, for the BBC and I will explain you a little bit how I got uh, to do that kind of work, um, connections etc and we'll look at the queue and a little bit the, the process so uh, how it works to work with a producer, with a director um, and yeah how important it is to have a little bit of a unique voice and to bring something uh, kind of fresh to the table and I show you some different examples that I submitted, submitted to the producer and director and I tell you a little bit what they, uh, they were thinking about it. Um, I'm using BBC Symphony Orchestra here, uh, the Discover version. So obviously four years ago I didn't have uh, BBC Discover, but I kind of rearranged it a little bit to use this plugin, which actually works really, really well. And you will see, I even back then I only had just started working with Spitfire and I didn't really... Um, spend any money or use any expensive sample libraries to to create this score and I'll tell you the reason why just kind of afterwards and throughout uh, the class so but before um, we dive into the session let's just get our mindset right here I've prepared like in a proper master class a, um, a slideshow here uh, don't worry don't worry it's only a short one 
And it, it, I just, yeah, I just want to kind of share my thoughts and I've researched a little bit about this as well. And I'm, I'm very interested in, yeah, how, how you can kind of stand out, develop your own voice. And um, I recently just uh, read David Byrne's, Byrne, Byrne's book, uh, Talking Heads Guy. Um, just slipped my mind to na- the, uh, how music works. A very good book. I would recommend it. And I just watched the TED Talk. So basically explains how architecture influenced how uh, how people write music, you know, how how Wagner was b- building his own uh, concert hall according to his music, you know, and then you have like kind of an end of 80s, 90s, look, you know, big sound systems in, in the cars where then like this big rap and hip hop was produced with massive low ends and the voice somewhere in the middle and, and, and big high ends and stuff. And so I just recommend it, go and watch it and... Um, I think it has a little bit of an influence of how I view this kind of developing your own creative voice. Um, And I believe whether you create concert music, uh, so your own music, or writing for film, TV, or or game, I think it's equally important to to have your own uh, voice. It's just that the the rules of the games, of the game changes slightly. You know, if you write for a TV or, or film, you know, you obviously have a director, a producer to please. You might even have a temp track. If you work on an ad or library music, you have pretty tough guidelines. But as we go through it, I tell you how I also find that really important. So um, definitely develop your, developing your own creative voice will always bring you a step further to being heard, standing out, and finding work, you know, getting employed. Um, even if you, you know, if you haven't really scored that much, it's just if you're true to yourself and people can feel that, you know, and I think, you know, being heard, standing out, finding work, this is the things we strive for, um, if not fear, when we kind of uh, about to finish university. At least it was for me, you know, like two, three months left and it's like, oh my God, what am I going to do afterwards, you know? Now, why is uh, developing your own voice um, important? Be yourself, everyone else is already taken. I love that quote by Oscar Wilde. And I think especially, I know that it's sometimes hard, you know, if you work in film on TV, like I had, I had received so many short films that were made with zero money and they put the Inception soundtrack on there. And it's like, well, you know, you you made the soundtrack with, uh, you made the film with zero money, but you're expecting me to make a soundtrack that sounds like Inception with probably also zero money. And so we have to always imitate some someone sometimes. But I think there are little tricks that you can still bring in your own flavor, you know. And so I think this quote is really amazing um, uh, by Oscar Wilde here. Creating your own voice means that you're unique, that you have authenticity, that you have, you know, realness, a passion. And that's what people, uh, that's what gets people really going. And it will make them aware, I think, of your art and of your passion and of your person, you know. And it's important to to, to share that and bring that outwards. And, you know, some of the biggest artists have, you know, something in common. And that is um, a distinctive recognition value, you know. If you think about, if you look at these pictures, it's just kind of a bit of a random selection here. Um, nothing to do with my favorite or not favorite artist. Um, although I love all of them on here. Um, if you just go through it a little bit and think quickly how they sing or how they are as a personality, you can you can hear just one note and you know it's them, you know. And that is, for me, that is, you know, the, the top of, of having a unique voice, you know. Even just, you know, one scream, you know, if I look at James Brown, it's like he's got that, you know, that specific just, I'm not going to imitate it here, but y- you all know what I'm talking about. Or, you know, Led Zeppelin, Robert Plant uh, kind of scream or Elvis's voice or, you know, r- rapping, you can always hear it's Eminem, you know. So it's, yeah, it's just, um, that's kind of the, again, the top of the creative voice. Now, in our industry, it's a little bit different because... Uh, we don't we don't have voices that we use, or of course some of you might be singers, but uh, usually we we work with production or with instrumentals. So how do we stand out? You know, and I have some examples here as well. And you know, if you if you take a look at these artists and think what they have done, what what their music is like, why they're famous, they they always have something really specific and. It's, of course, they're really, really good. And I think you will see in the next slide, it's, it has a big influence um, with developing your own voice, you know, just being good or being excellent. Um, in the internet, people say a goat, no, greatest of all time. 
Um, so, you know, if you, if we look at Miles Davis and his kind of smoky trumpet sound, you can, you can hear that out of all trumpet players, you know, um, Jimi Hendrix, obviously I'm using, of course, very obvious examples, but, uh, that is, I think the mastery of, of having found a really unique voice. And there is thousands of artists that have an equally amazing voice, you know, uh, but may, may have not gotten as famous. Um, if we look at the classical composers, you know, uh, for example, Mozart, who made kind of piano concerto um, uh, famous. And if you look at, for example, at Bach, you know, with his like Baroque style, where like influenced by like Italian and French styles, uh, which is also a very important part for me, how you, you know, you're like a filter. I think your inner kind of creative person is like a filter. You, you get inspired all day from all these different things and inside you, it mixes it up it mixes it up and something comes out and, and that, is, that is kind of you. Unless you're trying to kind of imitate someone, then then I think you've, you'll find it harder to find your own voice. Imitate to practice, that's a different uh, story. But uh, other than that, I'd, I'd say, you know, be true to your to yourself. If we have a look, you know, John Bonham, Led Zeppelin, his drumming style, super wild, energetic, B.B. King with his like vibrato on the guitar, uh, uh, Debussy, kind of uh, introduced uh, the impressionist style and kind of made made that uh, famous or attached his name to this to this style we all know john williams of course you know his writing style influenced by jazz you know if you think about catch me if you can etc um then we have other artists for example oliver arnold we collabor collaborate uh, frequently with him his, his production value you know it's just so absolutely amazing you can hear it's his music by the way he uses the beats, the way he uses the strings, he has this kind of, I would say, you know, we call it the Scandi string sound. It's because he works with a certain group of people in a certain room. He has a certain EQ that he applies to the strings, certain reverbs. All these combination combinations make his sound, you know, his string sound. Um, and it's, it's funny because it's his string sound, even though he doesn't play the strings, you know, so it's... That is how, how much of a voice he has as a, as a producer. Similar with Niels Fram, you know, with, with the whole felt piano movement that's pretty much he himself made, made this big and, you know, his kind of warm synths, etc. You can, you can just always hear when it's a production by, by him. And it's, it's just for everyone, I could say something on, on, this, um, on this slide. And a thousand more artists, of course, but I, I guess you get, um, uh, you get my idea. You, you might have realized, I said, developing your own creative voice uh, and not finding your own creative voice. So it's not a matter of finding it. You don't know when you find it. You just, you, you constantly develop it. I don't know whether I found it, you know, um, or it's, I'm constantly developing it, learning it, and no one else is going to find it for you either, you know, so it's, so it's, it's a development. The main components are, for me, the ones I've listed here. So, if you think back of these artists we looked at, what they always have such a huge passion. They when they when they perform live, it's you know it's amazing. And also when you hear these people talk in their studios, you know they how they talk about their gear and how they perfect their their production, their EQs, everything. It's it's pure passion, you know. And and I think that's the number one thing. And then practice. So I think developing your voice again, it's. You don't just find it somewhere or buy an instrument. It's like, oh, this is now my voice. You know, it's it's practice. I kind of believe in this 10,000 hour rule um, because all these instrumentalists that are amazing and have really their tone. I really believe they play it probably, you know, since they were five or 10 years old, every day, eight hours and developed their voice like that. Uh, persistence, uh, patience, like, you know, it, it will come, I think. Uh, curiosity and openness as well. Very important assets for me. Um, you know, when I meet uh, artists um, and we talk, they always want to know everything and they're always open, you know, and there's, there's never judgment. And I think these are very important assets and fearlessness, obviously just, you know, do, do what you, you feel is good and what you feel is your passion and uh, don't compare, you know, we compare too much, I feel, and oh, this is good, this is bad, or oh, this is not like that, or, you know, this is... It, pointing fingers. And I think that's, that's a real blocker of, of creativity. And uh, your experience, obviously, is very important. So everyone's journey is different, but that's exactly your strength. Your experience is unique, you know, use it. It's kind of um, a bit of an end sentence of this uh, first part um, of, the, um, of this um, masterclass. 
Um, so, and I, what I want to encourage you is I get a lot of questions asked, you know, how do I find work? What, what's, what shall I do? Here's my por portfolio. Here's my show reel. Um, what, shall I just send emails? Shall I, what, what's, you know, and the, the true answer is there's just no real, just one single answer. You know, everyone's journey is slightly different as I'm saying here. So it's just important to be open and learn loads of people's different journeys and then kind of through that you develop a, an own your own strategy what i definitely find important is be out there you know no one's gonna know about you if you just stay in your studio no, no one's gonna find you you know no one's gonna knock on your door and be like hey i have a job for you um so there's different ways i mean the social social media is so you know it's, it can be tough but it's also easy to get out there like create a youtube channel make make educational videos, create a cool Instagram account, upload your music, you know, you don't need a record label, you can upload it on, on Spotify really easily via, you know, DistroKid or whatever. Um, then send, maybe send some emails to your favorite composers, ask for an assistantship, you know, maybe go, um, in my case, when I moved to London, I was actually at Tile Yard, so where Spitfire is based, and I interviewed the guy who was just managing the facilities, because he had a, um, he, I think there was an assistantship available or something like that. And it had nothing to do with music. I just thought, first of all, I need a job. I need to pay my rent. And I just want to be in an environment where, um, where other musicians are around. And I did knock on Spitfire's door that first time I went to Tile Yard, uh, but no one opened the door. I, I remember Jess, <laughs> she was a receptionist and um, she said, oh yeah, Christian is very busy at the moment. And so it was then later that I had met him uh, in an event, like a couple of months uh, later. Right, um, let me quit this and then we're going to head over to, the, um, to my session. What I want to say is, I mean, this is a class about developing your own voice, you know, I'm not saying this is the key to everything, that's what you need to do, but it's, it's an important asset. And of course, there are situations where you need to adapt. Um, you know, you have temp tracks, as said, with directors, producers, they might want to change your sound. You might have your favorite instrument and the director goes, I don't like it, you know. So you, you've, you've got to follow these kind of rules. But again, every project is an opportunity to learn, you know. The, the director might throw you out of the comfort zone and you learn something new and that adds again then to your unique voice. It's just important that you do loads of stuff, loads of writing all the time. That's kind of the monologue over. I guess the whole thing is a monologue, so no, it's not over, but <laughs> the first part uh, of it. Okay, um, so let's rewind uh, five years. Um, I had just started working as Christian's assistant. We went to the pub every Friday, um, lunch, back in the day when people used to go to pubs. And we were about a team of like five or six uh, people. And he had these really good friends and... Uh, he is also a TV and film composer and he sometimes joined us for, for lunch and we're just sitting there and he goes like, oh, I've got so much work. It's, ah, I don't know what to do. I've, it's just crazy, you know? And I'm thinking to myself, wow, like I know a ton of people who look for work, you know? So I'm saying, just coming from Berkeley where, you know, one of the key things is try and help each other out. You know, of course, we're all um, fighting against each other in that sense to find jobs. But I think it's important to, to help each other out because there is always a certain job that someone else does better. And if you recommend that someone else, it will come around. That's anyway how I, how, what I believe. And I put forward my friend who just moved to, to London and said, look, my friend, he, he just moved to London and he could do with some work, you know, can I put you in touch? And kind of Christian gives me a, under the table a little bit of, you know, with his foot kicks me a little bit and, and, you know, kind of says, get in there, get in. And then I said, oh, yeah, but, uh, you know, I also have some, some time, you know, knowing that he meant I should put myself forward. Um, because this, this other person, he was quite, you know, concerned what the assistant can do, what not. And Christian probably could tell a little bit how I was as an assistant and recommended me then to this other person. And he said, well, look, it's actually not an assistant job. It's actually a, a, a composer job. I need someone to write the whole score for this BBC documentary. I have no time. And uh, I know the producer really well. And I put you in touch with the producer. And I'm sure you can do uh, some really nice stuff. And there I was. I mean, you know, before Berkeley, I was just touring around with bands. And within two years, I was tasked to, to score this BBC documentary. So I was pretty overwhelmed and... 
it was kind of, you know, being thrown into cold water. Um, so, but that's how the job came about, really. I guess it was a mixture of trying to be kind, helping each other out and going to the pub and have a beer. So I guess in my scenario, that would be my recommendation to find jobs. Um, but yeah, no, getting aside, it's just, it's, it's, it's always a mix of, of uh, certain things. So, and then he, he tasked me to write um, just a bit of music. I had no picture yet. He, and he said, it's a TV documentary, write something neutral, perhaps, um, not perhaps, but it's a TV documentary with babies. It's about a five-star hotel or a hospital in the middle of London where people pay like ridiculous amounts of money to give birth, like 20 grand a night, you know, uh, people like Victoria Beckham and, you know, go there to give birth to their precious little babies. Um, and then it needs to be a bit more positive, but also nostalgic. Uh, but then try also to be a little bit ridiculous because it's quite ridiculous, you know, but not too on the nose. Um, make it look a little bit ironic. So um, I want to play you the first idea I came up with. I have it here only as a, as a, as a WAV file for the moment, but um, I just want to play this to you quickly. So I send this over and he, my contact, basically, he said, well, you know, this is, this is, you know, kind of what I'm, I'm listening to this and I don't even know what to say. It's not very great. It's just kind of a bit plain and doesn't really say much, you know, and that was kind of, you know, what he said. He said, oh, I'm not going to forward this because, you know, we want to, you want to be kind of unique. You want to bring something unique to the table. You want to give this documentary um, a voice you want to you want to color it in you know it, it's uh, you you want something original you know where where you can listen to it afterwards and be like oh this is from this documentary uh, kind of thing you know it needs something original and special um, and he just kind of gave me some tips he was like try some original sounds what what do you like playing you know what's your kind of sound what maybe try some unusual combinations um, you know because also we got to come for the producer we want to send something over that's you know, that is just the producer wanting more of it, you know. So I uh, I went and spent some time in the studio and stuff, and then I sent over this one. I'm not going to play you the whole thing. I'm going to fade it out, but you'll get the idea. So you get the idea. Um, so he calls me up and says, like, love it. Absolutely love it. I'm going to send this forward. Um, and I just kind of asked him, you know, why, what's, you know what, what, makes it say, what makes you say that, you know? And he was like, well, for a starter, the opening sound, you know, what is this even? You know, what is this sound? I want to, you know, I want to kind of figure out what did you do, you know? And then he goes, like, and then there's these pluck sounds that are, I can hear it's some sort of pizzicato, maybe I can hear some guitar sound, but it's, you know, it's interesting. My ear 
is drawn to it, yet over a dialogue, because in TV and in film, of course, dialogue is always king. That's like your lead vocal. So you have to kind of write around it a little bit. And it's a TV documentary. And in pretty much in TV documentaries, there's like talking all the time, you know, unless maybe it's nature documentary where there's a bit of space for lovely footage and stuff. But he says, you know, this, this will work really well. And with, with all these sounds, they don't get in the way. You have lead sounds, but they're kind of embedded. So with a mix, you can do a lot as well. And yeah, so he, he was pretty happy to send it over. And then the producer got in touch with me and said, ah, I've heard, I've heard the track. Um, we're really happy with it. The editor has already started editing uh, the film and used some of some parts of the track. Um, could you send us, you know, some more kind of variations and stuff? And then um, I just went into the studio and started writing a lot of a lot of variations just using that. I mean, the main work was 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 pretty much done. I had the color, you know, so I had this reversed Wurlitzer right here in the beginning. So the Wurlitzer, I have it uh, back here. It's kind of a little bit my my instrument that I, I used to tour a lot with it, and I abs I developed a love for it since since a long time, and um, I, I use it like through different uh, pedals and stuff. If you if you know my sample library, I, I've done with Spitfire Audio. Then there's a lot of that kind of stuff through pedals, etc., and reamped. Um, I, I I just find it very expressive. I guess maybe. Deep down, I always wanted to be a guitarist. And then I just, I was just a keys player and uh, the Wurlitzer um, kind of helped me with being a bit more expressive. And then the rest, I mean, I'll, it, it's a similar color palette to this one. The one I've loaded here is, is actually the main theme. So I did, didn't use that as the main theme, uh, even though I just called it Portland main theme. Um, but it was the main color palette. From there on, I dissected things, you know, I took parts and I just want to play you a few things. And it, it might as well be that you have to work like that, you know, in, in, in certain projects. And it's actually quite nice because I could be really creative and create little pieces and snippets of music and that the editor actually took it and placed it. And I then, when I got the picture sent, my music was already there. I just had to dive into the session and uh, prolong things, shorten it, mix it differently because of the dialogue, etc. Um, but then I just got given a list of things, you know, um, what's, uh, what was needed. So here I'm using uh, similar things. I'm using uh, these kind of harp swarms, uh, the bassoon as the lead instrument. Uh, and then they wanted something actually that was a little bit different, uh, someone in, in a rush. Um, so like, you know, a doctor that kind of runs uh, through the hallways because the baby is having trouble being born or whatever, you know. <laughs> And so on. And I mean, you can tell kind of the production is really scraggly, but it's it's part of it. I recorded a harmonium, I think, which was live. Um, and then again, these kind of pizzicata, they're, they're not very tight. They're just a bit like loose, but it's part of the sound. And I think it's it, that's what I'm talking about, you know, trying to, to, to be a little bit different, try to find something something else that sounds a, bit, a little bit out of the ordinary. I'm not going to play you all the examples here, just a couple more things. Um, I had to, for example, oh, here is, for example, they, they really loved this, again, this reversed words to sound, so I, I just send them, send it to them uh, separately. Not much more. Uh, here, oh, here we have the actual chasing. Before it was, it wasn't really uh, that fast, was it? Um, I think it was just kind of rushing and now this is more of a chasing a bit faster.
And I mean, you can you can tell like I'm almost struggling with the harmonium there, like keeping the beat with my with with the pizzicato bass, and it's a little bit, Whoa. but it it helps it helps the whole thing, you know. My I guess my whole point is it's not always important to you know write perfectly uh, perfect scores on on with piece of paper in an orchestra and stuff. It's you know there's there's other opportunities, especially now you know where we live in a world of kind of Netflix and there's so many productions out there. Um, not just kind of your Hollywood worlds, you know. So, and then uh, out of that, they kind of asked me to to write a uh, main theme because they didn't want to use that, even though I, I liked that, the main theme there. And I'm not sure, I, I probably did a few versions similar to this. I remember there were some slower, some faster, but this one ended up, uh, I believe, being, being the main theme. And I'm just going to play it uh, to you and then I'm going to take you through it. Cool. And again, you hear there's not too much of a melody going on or an instrument sticking out. It's because the intro was played through um, a guy commenting what was going to happen in, in, in the show. Uh, so there was from, from beginning to end, there were uh, vocals or dialogue. So I have uh, my Wurlitzer here. And now kind of listening back, this kind of movement, it's, it's very simple, da-da, 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 like, it's like a triad. I find myself doing quite a lot and then like doing other voices on top of it. So when you do stuff a lot of the time, I think you, you, you keep doing similar things. It's, and I think it's good. Some people say, well, it's, you, you fall into the same traps, but it's obviously not exactly copying what you, what you, use, what you do, but still it, it's, it belongs to your style. I have a little bit of EQ on here for those of you who are interested in the production, just taking out, out the low ends. It's usually a bit heavy um, on the low mids. Um, actually could probably take out a bit more, but this is this is uh, not the time to do that now. So I have a little bit of com uh, compression. So I want to just to sit it really nicely in the mix. Chorus uh, and uh, tremolo effect. And then uh, what I was explaining before, I'm just kind of doubling up loads of things. So... Uh, here I'm using the BBC Symphony Orchestra Discovered the Flutes. So um, I believe you guys uh, in, in the masterclass, you, you, you all have the plugin. Uh, for you guys here on YouTube, this is our free plugin. So you, you can get that for free. And if you sign up um, and you have to wait 14 days, I believe, and fill out a questionnaire. And um, it just, it's an all-in-one tool for, for the orchestra. So um, it gives you all the sections, so you have the strings, first violin, second viola, uh, celli, bass, etc., uh, percussion. So, and it gives you a very good impression of a professional orchestra, and it gives you really good articulations as well. All the major articulations you have, and I think it's just really amazing to mix it up uh, with with other stuff. So here, for example, I'm using the flutes as said, uh, together with the violins, but I'm going to play it like this first. Thank you. 
So it does a bit of a counter movement actually together with the violin. So it's not doubling up the world. It's, excuse me, it's doubling up the violin down here. So and by combining instruments, you get a complete new, you get a new instrument in that sense. Of course, combining violins and flutes has been done many times, but you know, in this kind of context, I like that sound. And, you know, people like Bernard Herrmann got famous because of unusual combinations of instruments. So I think uh, that's kind of a, a good way forward of achieving some new sounds. Then I have some pizzicato here. Uh, this one, uh, second violin, doubling up down here. I'm using a lot of flaps. I was In the beginning, I was explaining that I didn't really spend any money uh, buying any plugins. And it's because here I'm using the BBC SO, so that's free. And then the labs, this is also our free range. And you have some pretty amazing sounds. And actually these sounds, they're really well sampled. But in my opinion, they always have a little bit more character than actually our, our biggest products. And also our biggest you know, products, they're usually in combination with big artists, etc. So I believe that with the labs sample library, you can achieve much more of a unique sound. So here I'm using dulcimer hammered. Uh, Charango. So this one you could actually hear out. I believe one of them is just a tiny bit out of tune, but I'd, I like it. It sounds, it sounds really nice. Uh, so I have with these three instruments, so dulcimer, charango, uh, and the violins here. Uh, I'm actually having uh, doing cello as well, uh, creating this waltz feeling. And then the counter movements, as said, with the flutes, the first violins, as already played. And then the viola, I'll just play it for you. So it does kind of call an answer in between three instruments or three sections. And all of those three are kind of more of unique combinations. You have the whirly, you have the flutes, you have the pizzicato with the lap stuff here. And the viola does a little bit uh, something softer uh, in the background, something soft, soft and steady. And then the bass, I'm also doing something not saying out of the ordinary not has not been done before, but I'm just adding a little bit of flavor onto my usual bass here. So a bass pizzicato, one of my favorite sounds, one of my favorite instruments, actually, the bass. Adding the cello. So, and by adding a little bit of tape delay here, it's kind of a slap back effect, I'd, I'd say, if I just solo it. So you can hear it goes yada yada, and just together with with the with the bass, it gives it a little bit of a different bass sound than just your usual pit. And that for me, it's that that was enough. It added a little bit of color there, and then I'm using these uh, moon guitar trims. So I've used actually in the I think in the score I've used the uh, harp. Uh, trems. So we have harp trems in, in our uh, standard range and uh, moon guitar trems. And it's like when, when loads of uh, players play kind of picked and plucked sounds really fast and you have this kind of swarm sound. Amazing. Just, just this sound is, is very inspiring for new stuff. Further, I have some snaps and claps. These are from the older laps range, but I mean snaps and claps. You can also record it yourself. It just helps a little bit with the uh, waltz feeling there. I've got some timpani rolls from our percussion range here. And then I've got uh, this cabasa also helping with the rhythm. Oh yeah, it's the charango that's a tiny bit out of tune. That's quite lovely. Um, then I have some longs here, first violin and second violin. 
uh, on the discover range here uh, we have longs if if you upgrade to core or professional or most of our other um, standard range libraries they have a legato which means when they transition from one node to another they record a transition so it will get a little bit of uh, more of a realistic sound but it sounds nice because it's just these players of the BBC um, Symphony Orchestra are amazing and the room sounds amazing and that just help a little bit with the, with the reverb and these transitions. And also programming, very important, modulation and expression. Uh, if you check out uh, Christian Henson's uh, class further down the line, then he'll explain you some of the programming and the important tips and tricks. I'm using here a controller called Nano Control 2. So while I play, I move the faders and kind of give life into the performance of these sampled instruments. And then I have up here as well, bassoon and clarinets. For me, in TV, bassoon, clarinets, and or kind of drama in general, uh, they have very lovely melodic qualities, especially the bassoon in the higher register. It's like a singing voice. And important when you write for woodwinds or brass, always give a little bit of a gap for the player to breathe. That will help with your realism as well. Clarinet down here. Sounds like, sounds so lovely. And... Again, I really like the, the hybrid kind of sounds, combining the orchestral stuff with yeah, a thing such as Wurlitzer or like a guitar or something like that. And then here, right in the ends, I have uh, my reversed whirly sound just to, to end it. To end there uh, on the tonic. Cool, I think that was, that was roughly it. If you guys have any questions i think now it would be the time to do q a and you can you can ask me you can ask me anything i guess and i'll try to answer as 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 good as possible robert do you work off a template or create as you go i uh i usually create as i go but when i work on a film or on a project and i start um, putting together some first ideas i um it's kind of a template is being built automatically. So if I write my first cue, then I create this these sounds, etc. And then from there I I you know I create all the other cues. So I wouldn't then load an empty session for each of the cues. Um but I to be honest, I really like um working off a blank kind of sheet. Like I have templates when I, for example, work for ads and stuff and they say like, oh I want you to do Oliver Arnolds and Niels Fram and Max Richter, then I load up that kind of template where I've loaded up all these like kind of silky beautiful strings because I know it's going to have to sound like that, you know. But I don't, I don't have like a, a huge template um, set up with all the articulations and everything um, loaded in. I do actually have one downloaded now that Christian and Jake Jackson made, which is the BBC Symphony Orchestra Pro template, which is really beautifully rooted with all the stemming, etc. And I have actually used it before. So yeah, I have to, with, with the BBC, uh, I have that one. And, and it's really good because a lot of my friends and stuff have that library. So if I have to send something for a mix or so, then I can just send it and they use the same template. Um, I hope that, well, I hope that helps. Uh, let me scroll up a little bit so I don't forget. Um, okay. There was someone, Jeremy, question for you. As you become more in demand, would you say that you deliberately use sounds and ideas which reflect your voice or does your voice emerge naturally as a consequence of the kind of lots of writing, what you mentioned? Uh, well, interesting question. Um, I think it's the second one. I think it's, it emerges naturally. I think that your voice, it, it will just become your voice somehow. And um, I think it will be hard for yourself to point, pinpoint it down. So actually you kind of never really know when you, when you developed it enough. Or also you don't know 
when is enough you know so i think life is a constant uh, learning curve you know you always you will always learn you know um i mean i know now reflectively as i mentioned before i keep you know i keep seeing myself doing similar accompaniments on piano when i uh, when i write tracks maybe i have similar uh, on piano playing similar kind of almost licks that i play or Again, I, I use a lot to whirl it. So if someone asks for, um, oh, can I have something a bit more electronic or a bit more unusual? It should sound like a piano, but not really, uh, which actually I get a lot recently. And um, so it kind of emerges naturally to answer the story, uh, the story to, to answer the question. Um, Megan has a question. Megan Scott, do you think that creating your own synth samples is a valuable skill for developing your own voice? Oh yes, totally, totally. I, I completely left this out because I hadn't actually created any samples for this project, but I think it's the is actually the key. So I even made this ready here. Get actually one of these, and this is what Christian also would tell you, the founder of Spitfire. Even though we want you to buy our samples, um, get a microphone and record your own stuff. And I think that will help you massively with uh, developing your own voice and also with just getting better at things, you know, getting better at mixing, really listening out what kind of, what are the nice frequencies of, of what kind of instrument, etc. What are nice sounding rooms, what are nice sounding amps, what are nice sounding synths, instruments, and it will just bring you further as a, as a musician and it's kind of natural ear training as well. Um, and yeah, you get to know, you get to know the instrument you sample really well. Um... So yeah, incredibly valuable. Uh, Alvaro, thanks Oliver. Some tricks to put labs instruments together in the same room with say SSO or BBC. Um, yes, I, reverb, work with reverb. In this session, I've only used one reverb because again, this was, I haven't really tweaked that session that much. So this is, um, again, this is four or five years ago. So I was, I was a newbie back then. And um, I just use one reverb as a master reverb. But then you can also use um, different kinds of reverbs for different instruments and try and place them into the same room. And just mixing and, and balancing and maybe molding a little bit. For example, uh, the strings, I, I do a lot. Um, I find myself doing this a lot on the strings, taking out like three, maybe four, or two to four dB, around 2K. Um, and it kind of makes the strings sound a little bit more silky. Obviously, you don't want that for all of your sounds at all times. You're always going to know what you're doing and why you're doing it, etc. But um, try it out. This is a very nice kind of string sound. So, uh, yeah, but I'd say mainly mainly reverbs. Um, I hope that helps, Alvaro. Uh, Chris, do you usually develop your ideas through sequencing in Logic or do you start with a written score like through something like Sibelius. Oh no, I don't use, I don't write notes down or Sibelius. I, I can write uh, scores, I can read scores. I don't think really well anymore. Um, so I, I just do it sequencing in logic. I, I use a lot, much more my ear and much more like the quality of the sound rather than the technical writing of, you know, the harmonic structure or the melodic structure. I you know, I kind of let it flow uh, with the sound. And um, yeah, I think that would, that's that's kind of more me, more, more intuitive, you know. Do you manually EQ each instrument individually or do you have templated EQs for different instruments, tones? Oh, no, 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 no way EQs. Uh, no way templated EQs. I think each instrument is always different and the less EQ that needs to apply, the better I think you want to use very little uh, plugins as possible. I think you want to get the sound right and good at the source. You want a good player. You want a good sounding instrument. You want to mic it well. You want a good room. You want to, you know, all the other stuff. And then if it's still not sounding good or you need to correct something or for some reason you couldn't really achieve what was what I just mentioned in, in, in a good quality, then maybe a corrective EQ. But yeah, and definitely no templates on EQs, I don't think, because every, you know, you can't have like a flute EQ or, you know, it's always going to sound a little bit different. Unless, okay, the, the string example I said, maybe you can always be like, okay, I think I'm going to take this out because I know what effect it does on the string. Um, so in that sense, uh, maybe, but not as a kind of corrective thing or 
more as a creative EQ, I guess you can have like a, a templative kind of, um, or a template kind of thoughts, you know, um, I hope that helps. Uh, Matty, when it comes to temp music, do you feel that affects the ability to use your voice adequately and does that change your relationship with the project also got opw the other week and loving it fantastic work on that and the record oh thank you so much thanks for the kind words matty um much appreciated um and yes i think uh, as briefly mentioned i think the temp music is a little bit of a i wouldn't call it a problem but i think it's it limits our creativity and our way of being creative and show um our voices you know and um, but sometimes, you know, you have to maybe differentiate it a little bit by uh, um, making your own music and, and wanting to get um, work as a media composer, um, let's say in TV or something like that. But even then, I, I still think you, by doing it a lot, you will develop your kind of voice and producers and directors will get to know you and eventually they will come to you because they like your sound, even though you will, ha you, you will have had worked uh, to temp music quite a lot. But yeah, I'm also not a big fan of kind of temp music. <laughs> Guillaume, uh, thanks for this courses. How much time do you estimate to spend developing a track like that? This one, I mean, I can't remember, but now a track like this, it, sh it's, it, should, be, it should be done in a few hours, you know, two, three hours maximum. I mean, it's, it's more, you know, the, the programming and everything else is not complicated. It's more coming up with kind of the concept and what sounds are you using. But the actual track writing it, I mean, it's like three chords, a bit of waltz feeling and pizzicato. So in a technical way, it's, it's you know, not very... Uh, complicated so yeah two three hours i'd say maximum Jana, do you know uh, is it possible to save music soundtrack as a music score in cubase pro tools logic yes i think you just uh, uh you mean like a, an actual score yeah so you have the score sequencer here so you can com convert it So it gives you the the track, etc., and and the notes and the and the bars, and you can you, you can even tweak it inside uh, Logic. I don't know. I think Cubase has the the same. I don't know about Pro Tools, but I'm pretty sure it, it does. If not, you can also export it as MIDI and import it to one of those Sibelius or Finale. Um, so yeah, but the actually the the Logic one is pretty is pretty good, and. I mean, if you can afford, uh, many times when I re do real and live recordings, like for example, for, for my whole album, um, I did um, employ an orchestrator. So um, I would send the MIDI files and the notes, how I wanted to sound, etc. And, and he would then put it onto, onto paper. I think he uses C Sibelius. If you would sell me on which Spitfire library is the most unique, which one would it be? Something that no ordinary, ordinary library could do. Um... Most unique. I mean, it's it's. Uh, I like check out the Sound Dust stuff. That is pretty cool. It's a guy in Brighton that does these libraries. Actually, a different uh, company. I think his company is called Sound Dust, um, and we kind of resell his library. And that one is pretty amazing. But once I, I use the most in kind of my daily work, I would say is actually I've loaded some here. It's Chamber Strings. It's not in that sense unique but it's just absolutely mind-blowing and this patch here ensembles long flight time though this one is wonderful It just sounds really lovely. It's it's a library we've recorded um, a few years back, and this patch, long flight down a, a certain way, a st the string uh, section plays, and it sounds amazing. And then we've got all of Oliver Ar Oliver Arnold's libraries. I mean, but then I guess being unique is not the right word because that's very much his sound, you know. But it's like these strings, for example, these waves, you know, where you just you don't even have to touch the expression and dynamics. You just go.
it's just it really sounds amazing just playing a couple of chords but yeah sound dust is really cool check check that one out and the swarm harp swarm i like as well uh, as mentioned before oh glass and steel <laughs> i read here great class and i just remembered glass and steel <laughs> check out glass and steel library that's like a kitchen where uh where christian recorded his like glasses and tapping on things etc and then uh we've morphed uh, these sounds and stuff so that is actually one of my go-to libraries as well when you add need to add something something specific Joe Berry, do you always mix your own scores or do you send them to, you send them to a mixer? Usually I mix my own scores, especially if it's kind of for smaller projects and TV stuff, because then there's no budget for a mixer. And if there is a budget, I would definitely use a mixer. Actually, I used a mixer in, in The Haunted. This was a uh, film I scored with, with my friend Homai and um, we used a mixer there. Yeah, that would, I mean, I think... If you can get good at mixing yourself and mix while you compose in that sense, I think that will be a big advantage in your career. Amazing. Thanks for everyone's input and participation via the Zoom Masterclass and via YouTube. Please check out the rest of the Masterclasses. There's some pretty amazing content coming your way. Keep in touch via YouTube or other social media. And if you have any technical issues or questions, please get in contact via our customer support. Very important, if you want more free and amazing samples, please check out pianobook.co.uk. And if you want to share your work uh, and videos, for example, you've made using the BBC Symphony Orchestra, please check out the page via spitfireaudio.com. So that's it from me. Take care of yourselves and see you in the next one. Bye bye.